Hi, and welcome to In Search of Insight, Nootropics Depot's monthly podcast. I'm Erica, or Nootropics Depot guru on Reddit, and sitting next to me is our product specialist, Emil. Hey, everyone, and you can find me on Reddit under Pretty Chill. Today, Emil and I are going to be talking about a fascinating question that has led to hours of research and lots of new discoveries. And this question is, should men and women treat supplements differently? Yeah, fair warning. This is a complex topic. We'll be talking a lot about hormones. Hormones are really complicated and especially how they change as we age and the differences between men and women. It's it's going to be a very interesting journey, but it's going to be a complex one. Absolutely. So to get started, we wanted to make a couple things clear. The first thing is that we're going to be talking about sex hormones in men and women. We're using men and women as colloquial terms, male and female, and we're also going to be talking about the differences and similarities in how these hormones show up in men and women. But the first thing that we really want to discuss, which is very related to Nootropics Depot and to supplements in general, is whether men and women should be looking and taking supplements in a different way based on the different hormones that we have in our bodies, the way that our hormones change over time, and the way that we absorb different compounds and different materials based on our body compositions. And and I think we should start with pharmacokinetics because there's some major differences between men and women, but at the end of the day, maybe they average out and it's not as big of a deal as we think. And I think that's the easiest step in here. So let's talk about that. So what are the differences? What what are the main examples of differences in pharmacokinetics between women's absorption of certain compounds or certain foods versus men? When you're looking at a crowd that has an equal proportion of men and women, what is one visual attribute that you can see the main difference between men and women just looking at them oh i don't know the women are dressed better (laughs) (laughs) that's definitely true but you'll see a difference in body size usually i think on average women are a little bit smaller than men and this relates a lot to the pharmacokinetic differences especially when we go a little bit more in depth there so men specifically have a higher content of water throughout their body Women, on the other hand, have a slightly higher proportion of uh, adipose fat throughout their body. And this really can have a pretty profound effect on how drugs are metabolized and spread throughout the body. And body size in general makes a big difference too. I think men in general are a little bit taller, a little bit heavier, have more body mass. So can handle actually higher amounts of certain compounds than some women can, just purely based on body size and composition. If we're looking at a very popular culture type of example, if you look at alcohol consumption, there's a big difference in how alcohol is metabolized between men and women. And there's a lot of research on this. So this is another thing to keep in mind here. There's a lot of research on the differences on how compounds absorb between men and women for pharmaceuticals and for things that are really in the in the public eye. Like Socially alcohol. acceptable, you know, perhaps. Yeah, like you'll you'll definitely see studies on alcohol b- differences between men and women. Probably not as much with cannabis between men and women. Um, but alcohol is a, is a good example. It's very well studied, and the differences between men and women are really well studied. Ethanol is water-soluble, so it will be diluted by the water content in your body. So if your body composition contains more water, in the case of men, alcohol actually gets a little bit more diluted. If you have less overall water content in your body, which seems to be the case for most women, then that alcohol will not get diluted as much, which means you can achieve higher serum levels of alcohol, higher blood alcohol levels. Yes, in layman's terms, women are going to get more drunk from the same amount of alcohol compared to men because we are not absorbing and diluting alcohol in the same way at the same rate as men. Yes. 
So this relates to maybe all water soluble compounds then. Alcohol is a good example and you see that just the dilution factor is not entirely there for women so peak concentrations are easier to reach which for intoxicants is not very good and can be extremely unsafe especially during binge drinking or um, at, at bars women get offered drinks very often so this can be an increased risk factor for women who are drinking alcohol just their body composition it's also kind of an interesting behavioral situation to consider and to think about because i can think of many times where i have had one or two drinks and felt quite altered and yet i might be with some male friends who have the same amount to drink but they say they're fine they don't seem to be acting drunk and there is definitely a difference in the way that I notice that alcohol affects me compared to my male friends. And it's not just because of uh, social behavioral differences. It's actually because of body composition differences. Absolutely. And this is something we, we don't really think about. But it's definitely happening. Also, women have less alcohol dehydrogenase in their uh, gut so they're actually not as good as metabolizing alcohol as men are so women will actually not only have higher peak concentrations of alcohol alcohol will also last a little bit longer in their system so from a similar amount of alcohol erica will be getting more drunk and drunk for longer than i would lucky me (laughs) lucky you For the most part, yes. But also, it makes me think about what the potential health risks are for women, particularly with liver and kidney health over their lifetimes, knowing that we are not as fast at absorbing and metabolizing alcohol. Yeah, that's definitely a risk, an increased risk factor than there. So alcohol is a good example, and then when we look at other water-soluble compounds, you could maybe see in women that you would have higher peak concentrations because you're not diluting it as much. Of course, alcohol is is also a bit of an interesting example because you need many, many grams to achieve effects, pharmacological effects with Versus alcohol. Versus nootropic supplements or, you know, other botanical supplements, which you might be taking, you know, some low, low milligram amounts of. Yeah, let's consider caffeine, for example. So caffeine is water-soluble, and the dose is between 1 to 400 milligrams on average. So that's quite a small amount of material when you compare it to at least, I think, a beer has about 40 grams uh, of alcohol in it. If you if you look, what is that, 5% of, of a normal beer can? Let's let's go with the tall boy. We're, we're drinking half a liter of liquid. Five percent of that is alcohol, so then we're ah, we're actually looking at twenty-five grams of alcohol. Then, right? Is my math correct there? It's been a while since I thought about uh, volume volumetric math in this way. So, Emil, help us out with the with the calculator real quick. Yep. Yeah. You got it. Twenty-five grams. Okay. Boom. <laughs> uh, I, um, my math skills seem to rapidly deteriorate on these podcasts. So, you're getting about twenty-five grams of alcohol per tall boy can of beer that's that's around five percent that's pretty standard we're so, talking pbr i guess yeah we're, we're pbr we're not drinking uh, cans of ipas when we're drinking cans of ipas that amount gram wise of alcohol really goes through the roof so that's a consideration if you're drinking ipas but, but rather than comparing beer let's compare beer to coffee yes so with coffee you have the active ingredient quite a low amount so the dilution is probably not factoring in there as much with alcohol if you're really getting to levels of intoxication maybe you're drinking 75 to 100 grams of alcohol so that's a lot of ethanol that's just floating around your body and then you can see the dilution is probably having a bit of an extra effect there okay so what you're saying is that there's not going to be as significant of differences in absorption or metabolism of small amounts of, let's say, caffeine versus large amounts of, let's say, alcohol between men and women. Yes and no. 
there's definitely other mechanisms at play here too. We're just looking at this dilution factor here and for ethanol that definitely seems to have a big influence. And then of course, coupled with the fact that women have lower levels of alcohol dehydrogenase, so they can't get rid of alcohol as readily. If we look at other water soluble compounds, and actually when we look at caffeine, women can under certain circumstances metabolize caffeine either much faster than men or much slower than men. How, would, how does that work? Women on birth control actually seem to metabolize caffeine a little bit slower, so there definitely seems to be a hormonal um, aspect Link. here. Yes. So hormones seem to influence the metabolism of certain compounds. Uh, this seems to be the case with caffeine. But in general, women metabolize caffeine a little bit quicker, but they might reach slightly higher peak concentrations. So then when we move to fat-soluble compounds, women have larger fat stores than men on average. And then you can imagine that fat-soluble compounds would get stored there more often. So if you're looking at potentially toxic compounds that can build up in fat, women are a little bit more susceptible to this. What's an example of that? Hmm. Yeah, what's a fat-soluble toxin? R right off the top of my head, I can't really pull one up, but le let's curve just... Curveball. Curveball. Let's just talk about something maybe we all know that THC gets stored in, in fat tissue. Oh. Uh, so while that may not necessarily give effects, if you think about drug tests, people with higher fat content will likely test positive for THC a little bit longer because more of that THC is dissolved in their adipose tissue. So for women, you likely have, or if you look at the differences between men and women, women will likely test positive for THC a little bit longer than men on average because they're storing more of that THC. But if you think of other compounds, pharmaceuticals or something that that are fat soluble and they're they're dissolved in that adipose fat women's bodies can maybe hang on to that a little bit longer which can be an important consideration here too absolutely so let's start nearing toward how these differences in pharmacokinetics are applied to supplementation because we've talked about alcohol and we've talked about thc and we've talked about some different kind of more general familiar compounds and how they might differ but i'm curious when it comes to nootropics and supplements, what are the considerations that we should make? And do we have information about solubility, like the water-soluble compounds and the fat-soluble compounds? And are we able to actually make decisions, you know, as a woman or as a man? And is this information available out there? This is where it gets a little bit tough. So there's very little, if no, research on women and how they take in supplements and herbs and vitamins, maybe a little bit uh, of research there, but specifically for supplements, there doesn't seem to be a ton of data out there for the differences between men and women, which is a shame. And actually, it's only been a very recent thing that in even in clinical trials, they are stating we had this many women and this many men. And that they have a nice equal split between men and women because the pharmaceutical industry is certainly aware of differences between men and women. And it's very important too because a dose that's totally fine in a man might be completely toxic in a woman. And for those of you who've been living under a rock, most clinical trials are not making a point of testing pharmaceuticals on women. They are using men as the default, and they're not actually taking into consideration women's hormonal profiles, where they might be at in their cycle, or where they might be at in life uh, for older women within perimenopause or menopause. And so this is something that's really important to consider when thinking about supplementation, because not only is there less research for supplements and the differences between men and women, but in pharmaceuticals in general, there is a very, very big lack of, of research and of evidence and how pharmaceuticals are working within women, which has proven to be problematic for a number of different medications. We're not going to get into that, 
but uh, just had to put that out there for anyone who wasn't aware of that. And this is why one of the big reasons why we're having this conversation on In Search of Insight. Yeah. So nowadays, there's definitely more research being done on, on women and the differences between men and women, and especially in pharma. It's, it's kind of a requirement now, too. So that's really good and good that we're moving towards more of that. If you look at it even going a bit of a tangent, crash dummies, when we're testing cars for safety features, crash dummies have been modeled historically after an average male body. There's two problems with that. The average male body of 50 plus years ago is not accurate anymore because we've become bigger and and fatter. So our body sizes are bigger. Um, That influences how we crash in cars. But more specifically, there's very little crash dummies that are anatomically correct to women's bodies. So there's been a push actually to make female anatomically correct crash dummies and crash dummies that are a little bit larger in size so we have more accurate data there and you see the same in the pharmaceutical world so similar to this push within you know the crash dummy example or the pharmaceutical world we are talking about this topic uh, today because we're curious about the question should men and women treat supplements differently but we're also really motivated to get more information out there for women who might be at various points in their life and in their hormonal cycles, because there is not a whole lot of information out there talking about uh, pharmacokinetics within women related to our hormone cycles. And we wanted to shed light on that. And we also wanted to just give a general understanding of what information is out there to discover and how we can use the evidence and the research that's available to understand both men's hormonal changes and cycles and supplements, as well as women's, much, much better. Yes. So now if we take it back to supplements, and maybe we have to touch on one other thing. So we've talked about pharmacokinetics. There definitely seem to be pharmacokinetic differences between men and women, different body composition, different deposits of fat and water. We, Men and women also have differing levels of cytochrome p450 enzymes so those are enzymes that play a role in drug metabolism or also metabolism of things like caffeine and and pretty much everything you find in supplements so there's differences there this is where it gets hard though there's differences in cytochrome p450 activity between different men and there's differences in cytochrome p450 in different women so if you look at those two factors maybe the gap between men and women gets a little bit closer, especially because a lot of the things we take and environmental factors influence cytochrome P450 activity. Cytochrome P450 activity even is under circadian control, which means that its levels are expressed at different points throughout the day. So when you start adding these things up, then is there really such a large difference between when men and women when you look at pharmacokinetics and how things are absorbing? And a lot of the research I was looking at, the answer was kind of, if you account for body size and body composition, you get rid of a lot of those pharmacokinetic considerations. So, Which is pretty fascinating because I think that most people who are aware of you know maybe the shortcomings in pharmaceutical research for women have this feeling or maybe this sense that there has to be a dramatic difference between the way that women and men should treat their supplements but this this difference and similarity it kind of goes in a bit of a circle and i would say the one topic or or the few topics that we're going to touch on today that kind of jut into this circle and cause breaks in that is women's menstrual cycles as well as menopause. But the way that these affect the actual differences between men and women in supplementation on a practical daily level, it's a little bit uncertain. Yeah. And 
it's more so uncertain with pharmacokinetics because that can change so much from person to person anyways. If you have a large enough sample size, you'll definitely see clear differences between men and women. And in the pharmaceutical industry, it's important because a lot of the, the drugs that are being used are, are not entirely safe, but they are being used because sometimes they are life-treating medications. But that also means that you're usually kind of pushing the envelope of what is safe for a person. And if a woman is absorbing in a drug much more readily than a man, and they're not metabolizing it as readily as a man, then that could mean that they are reaching very unsafe levels of a certain compound. And I think in the pharmaceutical world, this should be paid attention to more, especially because if you look at the data, women are oftentimes prescribed the same dosage level as men, which means that they have much more pronounced effects with certain things, uh, which can be dangerous too. Furthermore, women seem to be prescribed more drugs than men on average, so there's also more uh, potential for interaction. So this is kind of moving away from the pharmacokinetic issue and moving more into... Um, can you call that a socioeconomic issue? I would say so. And, yeah. and one addition that I have for this uh, part of the conversation is women are being prescribed more medications in general, and we can't forget about birth control and hormonal birth control and the fact that there are large amounts of women who are on hormonal birth control and have been for a long time and will continue to be for most of their lifetimes. And this is a really, really big difference between men and women, the way that women's hormones are being changed by hormonal birth control. Yeah, and, and especially if you look at psychological medications, I think women on average are prescribed a lot more in different combinations of them, and those different combinations can interact with each other and have pretty unpredictable effects, especially when you consider the differences between men and women and how a lot of early pharmaceutical research was not being done with good separation between men and women and comparisons. And because of a lot of the medications that are in use currently are fairly old, then you can see some issues there. This is not really our place to be talking about this because we're doing supplements, but it's interesting to talk about because a lot of this research is happening in the pharmaceutical world and it's not happening in the supplement world so we have to take some of those lessons what's happening there to develop our understanding of how pharmacokinetics work in women and, and also to develop our understanding of the kinds of medical experiences that women are going to have throughout their lifetimes generally speaking and how these medical experiences may influence uh, women's understanding of their hormone cycles or perhaps lack of understanding of their hormone cycles and informing you and giving you a little more information about how those cycles actually work so that you are equipped with that information and can apply that to you know your health in general, specifically when it comes to supplements. Yes. So now let's move into pharmacodynamics. So we talked about pharmacokinetics, and if you account for body size and body composition, a lot of the effects of the pharmacokinetics can be overcome. So one just general recommendation for supplements would be maybe to start with a slightly lower dosage. For women. For women. That being said, we do beta test in the office different dosages, and women are definitely a part of this too. So our dosages take both men and women into account. If And I honestly, in the many years that we've beta tested, I've not detected huge differences between effect level in men and women. What would you say is the biggest difference that you notice in beta testing, just out of curiosity in general, like from person to person? If the difference isn't the fact that someone's a man or a woman, what do you think the differences actually are? I would say that when I'm looking at actual useful data for me to further develop a product, I'm going to look at the women a little bit more because they do seem to be more aware of what's happening in their body. And this is likely because way more things change in women's bodies. Okay, so 
what you're saying is that while you might not notice a difference in dosage recommendations or effects from a particular dose between men and women, the anecdotal stories and experiences from women may be a touch more valuable or just a touch more detailed because of these hormonal and physical, mental, emotional changes that we experience as a result of ovulation cycles and later in life menopause. Yeah, it just seems like women are slightly more in tune with what's happening, especially untrained individuals. So at a certain point, everyone becomes good at this beta testing thing, but you really have to pay attention to what's happening in your body and you really have to be able to slow down enough to just sit and go, okay, what's happening? And I seem to find that women without any instructions or training are better at this right off the bat. So I like female reports on beta testing supplements. Now, one of the reasons that might be happening is somewhat related to effect size, though. So we talked about pharmacokinetics. Now let's talk about pharmacodynamics. Pharmacodynamics talks more about how compounds bind to receptors and the actual effects that they cause. Women seem to be, in general, a little bit more sensitive pharmacodynamically. And this also changes during the menstrual cycle. And when we touch on estrogen a little bit more, it will become really clear why these differences exist. So one important point I wanted to make as we get into this conversation about estrogen is that we use the word estrogen all the time to refer to what is actually a number of different compounds that fall under this estrogen umbrella. And the primary compound that we're actually talking about when we say the word estrogen is estradiol. So we might use these terms a little bit interchangeably, estrogen and estradiol, throughout the rest of the podcast. But just so you're all aware, there are many estrogens, and estradiol is the one that we're specifically referring to when we discuss the menstrual cycle. And there's actually, specifically, there's four different estrogens, um, one of which only exists during pregnancy, E4. I actually forget what it's actually, what it stands for, but all of the estrogens have a letter E and then a number, so they go E1 through E4, and estradiol is E2. Estradiol has some really interesting neuromodulatory effects, and this, I think, is where some of these pharmacodynamic differences come from, too, because estrogen and progesterone and some of the things that progesterone turns into all seem to act as fairly potent neuromodulators. When estrogen is high, you see much higher serotonergic activity. So estradiol seems to induce higher levels of tryptophan hydroxylase. Tryptophan hydroxylase is an enzyme that turns tryptophan, which is an amino acid that we consume through our diet. It turns that amino acid into 5-HTP. And then 5-HTP is turned into serotonin by a different enzyme. But tryptophan hydroxylase, we call it a rate-limiting enzyme. So it means that the amount of that enzyme controls how much serotonin is being produced. Because we usually have a bit of a surplus of L-tryptophan. So it's usually the tryptophan hydroxylase enzyme levels that prevent more serotonin from being generated. So if we increase the amount of tryptophan hydroxylase, we can increase the total amount of serotonin synthesis. And estradiol seems to produce this effect. So it means that women, at certain points of their menstrual cycle, have higher levels of serotonergic activity. It also seems to act on monoamine oxidase, so specifically monoamine oxidase A. Estradiol seems to lower its levels, and monoamine oxidase breaks down serotonin and a few other neurotransmitters. But when monoamine oxidase A levels are high, serotonin levels are lower, as are some other neurotransmitters, and then when you inhibit monoamine oxidase A, or you decrease its levels like estradiol does, then there's less degradation of serotonin. So for those of you who are a little bit new to 
this conversation about neurotransmitters and about hormones and pharmacodynamics, I just want to give you a little heads up that things are about to get very exciting because we are discussing and getting into this meaty part of the topic of the podcast today, which is how pharmacodynamics of supplements are changing within women's menstrual cycles and how this is also linked to behavioral changes throughout the menstrual cycle and ways that we can use thoughtful, smart supplementation and information that we know about the menstrual cycle to benefit our health overall. Let's structure this because this is going to become a pretty complex topic. So if you are listening to this on YouTube, we are going to flash a graphic on the screen now. And this is going to help us explain this a little bit more and actually go through the entire menstrual cycle to see what happens. And this is going to be a good way to frame the pharmacodynamic equation of this. So to start, looking at this image that we have up on the screen, we are looking at the menstrual cycle from day one to day 28, which is the average amount of time that women's menstrual cycles take place. So we're also going to be looking at body temperature, as well as four key hormones in the menstrual cycle. The first one being follicle stimulating hormone. That one is in blue. The next one being luteinizing hormone, which is in hot pink. The one underneath is estrogen, which is gray. And then finally progesterone, which is purple. So just looking at this graph, Erica, can you tell me at what point in your menstrual cycle do you feel the best mood wise? Well, personally, I would say just from anecdotal experience right before my period, but looking at this graph, I'm also going to say that at about day ooh, eight to 12 would probably be when I feel my absolute best when estrogen is ramping its way up in the follicular phase. And there's a very good reason for this. So estrogen, as we talked about, seems to be quite an efficient neuromodulator. And estrogen increases serotonin synthesis. Estrogen also increases dopamine receptor density. It also increases the amount of total dopamine. So during this day 8 to 12 phase, um, which I guess is called the proliferative phase, kind of right in the middle of that, that is where... You're going to have the most amount of dopamine activity, the most amount of serotonergic activity, the most amount of norepinephrine activity. And GABA is kind of just normal at this point, but that's about to change. So when estrogen ramps up, you have these nice effects. And it makes sense because this is also happening right around ovulation. This is when women are most fertile. So if you look at it from a more evolutionary standpoint it makes sense that women feel their best around the time where they should be getting pregnant and for anyone who's curious about this and doing some more research in my research for this podcast i discovered this book called hormonal by marty hazelton and she is a researcher that explores estrus and estrogen and the effects of women's hormone cycles on behavior and sexuality but also just health in general. And so she discusses a lot of the behavioral differences and the changes that happen throughout the menstrual cycle when it comes to the way that we interact with men, the way that we interact with other women, our actual activity levels, as well as the changes that are happening in our bodies and the way that our senses are intelligently uh, have intelligently evolved to help us move through life. And so getting back to the conversation about nootropic supplements when it comes to the menstrual cycle, there are some really fascinating ways that hormones are changing and ways that we can actually take advantage of this great mood that we have during a particular point of our menstrual cycle. And it's because of what's happening in our brain from these increases in dopamine and these increases in serotonin. You can imagine that during this period of high estradiol, where you have decreased levels of monoamine oxidase A, 
you have increased levels of uh, serotonin synthesis, you have increased dopamine receptor density and, and more dopamine sensitivity. You can imagine that taking compounds and supplements that interact with serotonin and dopamine could be very intense during this period. And there's actually some really interesting research on this, especially when it comes to dopamine. So dopamine is broken down by a few different enzymes and transporters and monoamine oxidase too, but one of the main things that breaks down uh, dopamine is called COMT, C-O-M-T, and it stands for, uh, this is always a, a tough one, catechol O-methyl transferase, so COMT. COMT breaks down dopamine, so if you inhibit COMT, then dopamine levels can go up. And it seems like estrogen is a COMT inhibitor. But the interesting thing is that COMT expression is highly controlled through genetics. So some women have higher COMT activity, which would mean that they have lower overall dopamine levels. Some women have just genetically lower COMT activity, which means that they just always have a higher basal level of dopamine. When researchers were looking at these two different genetic differences in COMT level activity, the women with overall high COMT activity and lower basal dopamine levels respond really well in this 8 to 12 day period where estrogen is very high and then dopamine gets to the perfect level because one of the ways by which dopamine goes up is because of this COMT inhibition, which is very beneficial for this group of women who have overall higher COMT activity. On the flip side, for the women with lower COMT activity and higher basal dopamine levels, this period can actually push dopamine levels over the edge a little bit, which means that rather than dialing in focus and motivation, it can actually start doing some of the opposite things. So this is an important thing to look at, too, with supplementation. If you notice that during this period you're really nice and dialed in and you're focused, maybe that's because of that extra dopamine. And if you don't experience this at different parts of your menstrual cycle, then you might actually want to consider upping your basal dopamine levels by using something like Subroxy. So Subroxy contains a compound called Aroxalin A, which inhibits dopamine reuptake. And when you inhibit dopamine reuptake, dopamine levels go up. So for women who have lower overall basal dopamine levels, maybe taking something like Subroxy most of the menstrual cycle and then stopping Subroxy in that 8 to 12 day phase could help optimize dopamine in general. This is fascinating because I'm thinking back to my personal experiences with Subroxy. And I have to say, there were days where I would take Subroxy and I felt so much better, so much more focused, so much more dialed into whatever I was doing. But then there were certainly days where I would take Subroxy and it would really set me over the edge. I felt like my brain was going a mile a minute. I hardly had time to slow down to even catch the thoughts as they were coming out of my mouth or just flowing through my brain. And I felt out of control, definitely out of focus. And I ended up stop taking Subroxy because I couldn't really figure out why it was so effective for me on certain days and not as effective for me on other days, which is leading me to think that perhaps my comp levels are actually lower. Is that a correct assessment? No, higher. Higher. Yes. Comp levels are higher, which means that that increase in dopamine would actually be shooting me way, way oh, wait, over. No, you were correct. Lower comp levels, which means higher dopamine levels. Okay. So great. your basal dopamine levels likely are a little bit higher. So at that point, if your dopamine levels are already going up and then you're adding subroxy, then that could really send you over the edge. Actually, maybe we're, we're looking into this too much. Maybe for everyone during this 8 to 12 day period, they shouldn't be taking things like subroxy because even in women who are achieving optimal dopamine levels because they have higher overall COMT activity and thus lower overall basal dopamine levels, at this point, they achieve, usually seem to achieve optimal dopamine levels. So even in, in, in both groups then, 
taking something like Subroxy could send you over the edge. And if you were going to make it simple, if it's not broke, don't fix it. That's the mentality here. Yes. But actually going back to that and going into it a little bit more in depth, in this study I was looking at, the women who had lower contactivity and higher dopamine levels, they actually reported better mood and focus at, I think, right before menstruation, actually. So when you just said right before your period is when you feel best, might make sense if you have overall lower contactivity. Absolutely. I think that's something I've noticed over time. But in discussing research for this podcast, you shared with me some really fascinating information about the menstrual cycle, how it continues, and just the overall curves in estrogen and in the other sex hormones that we're talking about, follicle stimulation hormone, luteinizing hormone, the effects that this has on mood, and then from mood, how we might consider supplementation to help us achieve baseline and to optimize our health throughout our cycle. So if we look specifically at this moment in time or or these few days before the period begins and we say the dopamine increases that you experience are, are closer to perhaps your optimal levels, so why supplement then? Just let your body do its thing. What happens after that phase? So after that phase, dopamine levels go down quite significantly because now you don't have estrogen around to induce that extra dopaminergic activity. You also have less overall serotonin and norepinephrine. And if we look at customizing supplementation based on the menstrual cycle, the easiest way to go about it is for both groups of women, take supplements that enhance dopaminergic function from day one till about day seven, then stop because now estrogen is kicking in and that's giving you a nice dopaminergic effect. And then start it up again at, what shall we say, day 16, Erica? Yeah, I mean, I would say probably day 14, 14 to 16. Yeah, 14 would probably work well because then this estrogen effect on COMT is going away and also the the increased dopamine density and things like that are going down so maybe supplementing with a dopamine enhancing supplement would help there that way you can keep your dopamine levels a little bit more equal and this is something that we're discussing as it relates to mood and just overall feelings of well-being but one thing that's important to keep in mind is that hormonal birth control for those of you who are who are taking hormonal birth control, this is changing your hormone profiles somewhat. And yes. so the, this advice that we have uh, talking about the changes in estrogen levels is not so relevant for anyone who's on hormonal birth control. Great point. So this only really applies to women who are not taking hormonal birth control because when you take hormonal birth control, these fluctuations that we're looking at right now on the screen don't really happen. It, it's a lot more stable. Uh, so the the same effects don't really apply. But for women who are actively going through this normal menstrual cycle, this definitely has an impact. So schedule your stimulants basically around this period and avoid stimulants in that 8 to 12 day period because you probably don't need them and stimulants during this period might actually push you into non-optimal high levels of dopamine which can be counterproductive. It's kind of funny because I would say during this period of time I am certainly more attracted to stimulants. Caffeine is one that I can think of specifically but perhaps That has more to do with the behavioral effects of increased dopamine D2 receptor activity rather than the actual effects that I'm experiencing from the stimulants, caffeine, that I might be consuming. Yeah, what you're actually experiencing is a higher drive to uh, use mind-altering substances. Caffeine being a fantastic mind-altering substance, something we oftentimes forget, but especially with lower caffeine tolerance it's kind of euphoric it's nice and stimulating it gets your heart beating it's kind of exciting and then imagine if you are already at this elevated state and then you add in caffeine it's 
probably a little bit recreational almost and this definitely seems to be a bit of a problem during this period too where there's higher use of these kind of things but if we are thinking just purely functional and we want to stay focused and motivated and things like that controlling optimal levels of dopamine is very important and overshooting these dopamine levels can have counterproductive effects so the right amount of dopamine is what you need to shoot for to really dial in that focus and motivation and with the calm thing actually it's something that is tested by 23ME and um, I think Ancestry.com also does the genetic tests. They will tell you what polymorphism of the comp gene you have. So if you've done this genetic testing, just plug it into Prometheus. That's what I use. It will kind of break out all the different things. I actually, I have to go back through my Prometheus, but I actually think I have lower overall levels of comp. Um, which is kind of nice. It means I have slightly higher levels of dopamine at all times, perhaps, which is maybe also why I respond very strongly to stimulants. It's always something that comes up in beta testing. I'm the one that responds usually the most strongly to stimulants, and maybe it's because of my altered COMT activity. But this altered COMT activity, women are experiencing every menstrual cycle, so it's something to keep in mind. If you've done the genetic testing or you're interested in genetic testing, it's an interesting thing to look at. Look at that COMP gene. Look at the activity of your COMP gene. If it is low, it means your basal dopamine levels are a little bit higher. So stay away from any stimulants during this 8 to 12 day period where estrogen is high. If your COMP levels are a little bit higher, it means you're not going to have or you're going to have the optimal response actually during the 8 to 12 day phase and actually when you have low compt activity you're not having the most optimal response because you're already going a little bit over so it's really about moderation is what we're getting at here yes now let's move on to progesterone though so we've talked about estrogen and that's definitely a neuromodulator seems to affect everything and now we're getting into this luteal phase and in the luteal phase you see the purple line go up and the purple line is progesterone when progesterone goes up there is an enzyme called 5-alpha reductase which then converts progesterone to 5-alpha dihydroprogesterone then 5-alpha dihydroprogesterone is converted into a compound called allopregnenolone by an enzyme called 3-alpha hydroxysteroid dehydrogenase and allopregnenolone is a really interesting compound we call this a neurohormone meaning it has almost neurotransmitter like effects in the brain and allopregnenolone binds to the benzodiazepine site of GABA receptors and through this it causes a very profound relaxing almost muscle relaxant effect However, something really weird is going on with allopregnenolone. And maybe during this initial phase of the luteal phase, you get this uh, immediate increase of calmness and, and mood. But then shortly thereafter, it flips. And this is because allopregnenolone has biphasic effects, which means that it can produce both calming and uh, jittery, edgy effects. In this case, what seems to be happening is that allopregnenolone can restructure GABA receptors. And to understand this a little bit better, let's actually consider what a GABA receptor is. So when we say GABA receptor, it just seems like it's one thing, but a GABA receptor actually is a bit of a collection of different mini receptors. And these mini receptors we call subunits. Those subunits come together and then create a bigger GABA receptor. And specifically, we are talking about GABA A receptors here. On GABA A receptors, you have this benzodiazepine site. And when a compound like allopregnenolone binds to the benzodiazepine site, then in general, most of those subunits become more sensitive to the effects of endogenous GABA. However, 
allopregnenolone specifically increases and to a very significant degree a subunit called alpha-4 and alpha-4 actually does not respond to the increase in sensitivity because of benzodiazepine site binding by allopregnenolone. What this means is that this very rapid uh, relaxing calming effect of allopregnenolone is quickly followed then by an effect that's the complete opposite and this is because of this higher level of A4 subunits making up GABA receptors and GABA receptors in these A4 uh, or these alpha-4 subunits seem to turn over really quickly so this change happens super quick and in some research they found that exposing animals to progesterone for just 24 hours causes a massive increase in alpha-4 subunits and then makes it so that over time as this allopregnenolone keeps in your circulation the alpha-4 subunits keep going up to a point where women can become entirely unreceptive to benzodiazepine site activation. This is, is a big deal. Huge deal. I'm surprised this is the first time I'm actually hearing about it. But more interesting is actually that this seems to underlie a lot of the mood changes during menstruation too. So during this period, you get more irritable, which irritability is related to lower GABAergic activity. And that seems to be happening here. The interesting thing is it recovers. So you get this initial period of calming and relaxation. Then you get this period of the exact opposite. And then after three or four days, it recovers. And then the calming effects come back. And this is toward the end of the luteal phase. This is actually towards somewhat of the, the middle of the luteal phase. So okay. if, if we're looking at this image here, right at around, I imagine that's day 20, like the peak of progesterone there. Mm -hmm. So that's likely where those uh, calming effects are coming back slightly. And then you maybe have a couple days where this calming effect is at its peak. And then progesterone levels drop. And this kind of produces withdrawal type symptoms because you have this constant benzodiazepine stimulation uh, benzodiazepine site stimulation from allopregnenolone and then progesterone levels plummet and then allopregnenolone levels plummet and now you have a really interesting thing happen again this withdrawal phase actually increases GABA alpha 4 subunit expression again through a different mechanism. So what they think currently the, the best explanation for mood alterations during this late luteal phase is actually withdrawal from allopregnenolone and this increase in alpha-4 subunit expression. Which makes a lot of sense because this alpha-4 subunit expression causes a lot of irritability, it causes a less relaxed state of being, and it increases aggression. Something that I, as an observer of women through their menstrual cycle, have definitely noticed at certain points. I was just going to say, for anyone who is listening in that's, that's thinking, hmm, okay, this is uh, relating to my own personal experience, you're on the right track because it's not just prior to literal menstruation that we have mood changes. And I think that's the common understanding of PMS, right? We have mood changes, we get irritable, uh, we get more aggressive, perhaps more angry, more emotional right before our period. But it doesn't stop there. It actually continues to change. And for anyone who is not on hormonal birth control, who's going through these, these typical hormonal changes up and down throughout the cycle, you may have noticed this, and it's real. It's real, and we can document it and see it through this graph and also through this research. So it's really exciting to have this kind of evidence to back up the, the lived experience of women going through menstrual cycles, because a lot of times these subtle changes in mood can be a little bit hard to pinpoint the cause of, but we actually do have a lot of information available, and I'm glad that Emil is able to give it to us with the nitty-gritty specific scientific language 
so that we can better understand these experiences that we're having and then relate it to our lives and how we might use supplements to help us navigate these different phases of our cycles. Yeah, and because we have so much data on this and we're looking at a graph right now that's telling us exactly what's happening, of course, this is quite generalized. Not all women go through this exact same cycle. This, I mean, this, On these exact same days. On these exact same days, it, it's pretty predictable, but the increases and decreases in overall uh, hormone levels m- may be different from person to person. But generally, this seems to be the course that it takes. And considering that, my stack development uh, brain kind of kicked in, and I immediately look at this graph and think, how can I manipulate this graph? So if I'm looking at the beginning of the phase we have low estrogenic activity. We know estrogenic activity is good. And if we look at most of the rest of the cycle, estrogenic activity is remains somewhat elevated until about day 2018. It, it, it dips and then it goes back up again, but it's lowest in that first period, during the period, during menstruation. So if I'm looking at that, I would want to either enhance some of the things that estrogen does, like we talked about earlier, looking at increasing dopaminergic activity, serotonergic activity, things like that. But also, maybe we can actually substitute some of this lost estrogen. And a really interesting plan to look at then is Penex ginseng, because a lot of the ginsenocides actually attach to estrogen receptors. So there's two main estrogen receptors, ER-alpha and ER-beta. And the ginsenocides combine to both and can produce slight estrogenic effects without being estrogenic or without being estrogen or phytoestrogen necessarily. But they have estrogenic modulatory effects and if you look at Panax ginseng, what does it do? It gives you energy, it um, has good stress management effects, a good mood boosting effect. So my consideration would be take Panax ginseng in this early stage, maybe day one to seven or day one to ten, something like that. Then stop the ginseng because you have this increase in estrogen And because of this increase in estrogen, you likely don't need these ginsenocytes. So with that in mind, that first phase, you have some extra estrogenic activity, which should be beneficial. But then if we look at maybe we want a little bit extra dopamine there or a little bit extra serotonin, then one thing I would recommend is Subroxy. Subroxy will up your dopamine levels and then take some bacopa during this period too because bacopa does a very similar thing as estrogen it also upregulates tryptophan hydroxylase activity so now we're about halfway through the menstrual cycle if we're looking at this graph so now we're getting into progesterone increases yes and like we talked about the increase in allopregnenolone can underlie a lot of the negative mood effects So we want to attenuate this. And like we talked about, progesterone turns into 5-alpha-dihydroprogesterone through the enzyme 5-alpha-reductase. And 5-alpha-reductase is something that comes up constantly when we talk about mushrooms because mushrooms actually contain 5-alpha-reductase inhibitors. So if we inhibit 5-alpha-reductase, then we can prevent progesterone from turning into 5-alpha-dihydroprogesterone. And when there's not enough 5-alpha-dihydroprogesterone around, then not a whole lot of allopregnenolone is being synthesized because allopregnenolone is synthesized from 5-alpha-dihydroprogesterone. So my advice would be right at this, hmm, let's see, 14-day mark, start taking one of the mushrooms and not all of them have very strong 5-alpha reductase ability. Rishi is one that has great 5-alpha reductase uh, inhibitor potential. 
in one of the compounds that causes this 5-AR, that's, that's the abbreviation for 5-alpha reductase. So one of the main compounds that is a 5-AR inhibitor within Rishi are the triterpenoids. And the triterpenoids are highest in our lecithospore um, supercritical CO2 extract of cracked Rishi spores. And I think it's like 30 plus percent triterpenes, which is extremely high, and those seem to be 5-alpha reductase inhibitors. So my advice would be, right at this 14-day mark, start taking some lecithospore, which would then decrease the chance of allopregnan lung getting created, which would then smooth out the issues that can happen in this luteal phase related to moot. I love it. Let's keep moving. So we've got a recommendation for Panamax and Subroxy in the beginning of the menstrual cycle. Panamax, of course, I know this is the the ginseng you take, and it's actually the ginseng I take too, but any ginseng will work here. So our leaf will work. The leaf will have a more stimulating effect. So if you find that during menstruation, you're a little bit down on energy levels, then the Panamax ginseng leaf might actually be the one to go for because it's also a little bit more stimulating or if you actually find that you're a little bit more on edge and you want some more calming effects then Panamax is great and if you want some more middle of the road effects there then the Panax ginseng root is really good okay awesome so oh, and actually let's not forget about GS154 that's another one you could take however GS154 is pre-metabolized so that means that it actually doesn't really contain a lot of the original ginsenocytes anymore it's been put through an enzymatic fermentation process and i'm actually not sure what those ginsenocyte metabolites do in terms of estrogenic activity so my advice would be skip the gs154 for this purpose and look at just the leaf root or panamax okay cool so revising the previous recommendation just a little bit Subroxy and ginseng supplements in the beginning of the menstrual cycle. Another one actually you could take is L tyrosine. So L tyrosine is a precursor to dopamine. So that's another one you could take during this phase in addition to subroxy or just by itself for a more subtle effect. Very cool. And then moving into or getting closer to the luteal phase, the recommendation is to take a 5-alpha reductase inhibitor, and my favorite would be lecithospor. What's another 5-alpha reductase inhibitor product that we that we carry? Uh, so just any of the, the Rishi 1-to-1, the Rishi 8-to-1 would work really well. Um, I, th- I believe Lion's Mane is also a pretty decent 5-alpha reductase inhibitor, but I would say the best effects are going to be within Rishi, especially because Rishi also has a, a nice mood-elevating effect, and the lecithospore, I find, has a nice sleep-promoting effect. And I'll, I'll ask you this question. Would you need some extra support for sleep during the menstrual stage or when you're actually menstruating? Yes, particularly because I think sleep can get interrupted by menstrual cramps. That's a pretty common thing that women experience. And so any help with circadian rhythms and with sleep in general I think is very, very welcome during that time. Not to mention that I personally experience much lower energy levels during that time. So the better sleep I can get, the better I'm going to feel during the day, even with the other, you know, unfortunate side effects of menstruation. So then with that in mind, lucidospor would be a really good fit for you because it would help with sleep, it would help with overall mood, and it would help prevent this allopregnenolone nightmare from happening. Very cool. I've I've always wanted uh, an excuse to get into mushrooms a little bit more, but this is definitely something that's motivating me, and I'm very curious to try out the red reishi, especially during this this part of my cycle next time around. Yeah, and and then I would recommend stopping that at around the 28 day mark. I mean, honestly, you can take something like lecithospore throughout the entirety of the menstrual cycle, but, but if, it'll be most beneficial during this particular time. Yeah, and if we really want to put together a targeted stack, then we want to do that. And and to just keep it really simple, day one to day, mm, let's see, day one to day eight. You take the first part of the stack, then nothing from day 8 till day 14, and then 
from day 14 to day 28, take lecithospor. Are there any other recommendations that you have for addressing physical changes that are happening throughout the menstrual cycle, mood changes that are happening, and overall considerations for supplements that people might be taking daily, like magnesium, vitamins, other botanicals. Sustanch, I know, is something that came up in conversation earlier. I'm curious to hear what kinds of considerations we should have during menstruation for other supplements. If we're continuing the hormone line of thinking and we want to get into Sustanch real quick, this is actually a really interesting option because Sustanch seems to enhance estradiol E2 levels, which makes sense because Sustanch increases testosterone production, but Sustanch does not seem to be an aromatase inhibitor. And considering something we talked about earlier in this podcast, a lot of estrogens are generated from testosterone in women, in these granulosa cells in ovaries. So having a testosterone-enhancing supplement that does not inhibit this aromatization, because aromatization is how testosterone turns into estrogen, then that means that something like cystange might actually be enhancing estradiol E2 levels rather than enhancing testosterone levels in women. Although I found a study that showed increases in estradiol E2 levels with cystange and increases in testosterone levels with cystange in women. So this is a really interesting option maybe also to take from day 14 to day 28 because estradiol E2 levels are a little bit lower, so bumping them up with cystange could be an interesting option. This whole conversation that we're having about specific supplements that you can take during specific points of your menstrual cycle might seem contradictory to some of you who've been listening to the In Search of Insight podcast for some time, because we've had lots of conversations about why you don't need to cycle your supplements. And the truth is, even if you're a woman and you're menstruating, you don't necessarily need to cycle these supplements, but you may actually find more benefits by cycling these supplements based on your menstrual cycle just because of the changes that you're experiencing hormonally and the way that these supplements can help you optimize your health and your mood during these particular times of the month. So while we don't necessarily think that cycling is all too necessary for all kinds of supplements, If you are interested in optimizing and kind of riding the wave of your menstrual cycle and those hormonal changes, cycling is a really good way to observe how the menstrual cycle is happening and the ways that you can get closer to your baseline throughout the month. So with this in mind, kind of optimizing the the mental effects of the menstrual cycle, I think women actually have a distinct advantage over men because men don't go through this complex of hormonal changes every month, which also means that we can't use these hormonal changes to our benefit because there seems to be some negative things going on here, especially with the progesterone and withdrawing from allopregnenolone, but then there also seems to be very positive things going on, like this period of enhanced dopamine without really having to do anything for it. So this is one consideration for women to make, that if you want your supplements to be extra efficient, then play with the menstrual cycle a little bit. Learn a little bit more in addition to this podcast about exactly what's going on and and what receptor densities are changing and things like that and how you can use that to your advantage. So one cool thing is there's a lot of research on this. It's somewhat straightforward so it's easy to exploit and men don't really have this option so the positive thing for men though is it's more predictable so we can take supplements more consistently and focus more on long-term effects and we can really tweak it to work with our different hormone levels because Our hormonal story is simply not that exciting. We definitely have higher levels of testosterone during certain parts of the day, but 
hormone levels fluctuate for both men and women during the day, different cortisol levels and things like that. So with men, it's more predictable. It's a little bit easier to supplement. But then with women, if you're really paying attention and designing a stack around your menstrual cycle, then you can have some very interesting effects there. So what about designing a stack to deal with menstrual cramps? Yeah, I wish I could figure out something there. I still have a bit more research to do, uh, quite a bit more. But one thing that happens is that, and, and if we're looking at this image that should still be up on YouTube, we're looking at this secretory and then menses stage. And in the secretory stage, we're sh building up the lining and then shedding it. Within this lining, there's a lot of prostaglandin F2. And prostaglandin F2 is not really having an effect when it's locked up in this um, membrane. Uterine, uterine membrane. Uterine membrane, thank you. So it's locked up in there. But then when the uterine membrane uh, sheds, then the prostaglandin F2 becomes liberated. And the nasty thing about prostaglandin F2 is that it can induce muscle cramping. So it's actually the part of, part of the uterine lining that's causing the muscle cramps? Yes. So the, the uterine lining contains the compound prostaglandin F2, which then induces this cramping activity. Wow, this is, this is making so much sense. It's infuriating, but it's making so much sense because for anyone who has a period, you may notice that on days where you have a heavier flow, you have more cramping. And that makes so much sense because your body is literally getting pumped full of this cramp inducing compound. Yeah. Well, actually, it's in, in the, the shedding lining in the blood. So every all the liquid moving through, it's all chock full of prostaglandin F2. So everywhere it's coming in contact with, it can induce this cramping activity. Um, so one way to get rid of this is to attenuate PGE2, prostaglandin E2. And the way you do this is by using a COX inhibitor, uh, either a COX-1 or a COX-2 inhibitor. I think COX-2 inhibitors generally work a little bit better. So COX-2 inhibitors Part of the, and, and they're the class, one of the classes most popular for pain management effects. So when you inhibit COX-1 or COX-2, then prostaglandin levels go down, prostaglandin E2 levels go down, and this can attenuate some of the prostaglandin F2, but not 100%. So COX-2 inhibitors, COX-1 inhibitors can kind of dampen the the cramps and the pain and some natural ones include things like curcumin so that's a good one andrographis would work there are there any others than curcumin or andrographis yeah a, a lot of compounds that cause uh inflammation balancing effects they're usually doing it through cox2 i know hops uh are are a good one we used to actually carry a hops extract, but... Would PEA also work within the same mechanism? PEA, as far as I know, is not a COX-2 inhibitor, but PEA has pain management effects. So potentially combining something like a COX-2 inhibitor with PEA could help. I still have to figure out a way... If, if we think about the prostaglandin F2 is in the urine lining then how can we prevent it from getting into the uterine lining? So this is my line of thinking, and I have to do a, a lot more research to figure out how to achieve this. But if the issue is prostaglandin F2 being in this uterine lining, and then the uterine lining shedding, and then this prostaglandin F2 becoming available and causing cramping, then preventing it from being in the uterine lining in the first place would probably be the best way about it. However, you bring up an interesting point, which is that maybe there is another role for this prostaglandin F2 that we're not aware of 
even though it's causing this unfortunate effect of cramping further down the line. And I suppose this would be a good bookmark for further research because should we look into changing or reducing this particular compound within the uterine lining, what else might change? Yeah, that that's always a good point to think about. Is prostaglandin F2 there because it serves an important function? Or is prostaglandin F2 just there because it's there and it and it's is a part of super the, inconvenient? Right, and it's a part of the anatomy. It's yeah. part of the process. It, it does the cramping. It also causes contractions. So maybe during pregnancy prostaglandin f2 is more important but certainly needs further research certainly needs further research before we can discuss it at length yeah but it's an interesting target to look at and it would be an interesting target i think even if we're not completely getting rid of it which you can't but just reducing its expression in the uterine lining would probably have an overall great effect on reducing cramping during menstruation so curcumin and andrographis are the two big COX-1 and COX-2 inhibitors? Yes, and those would be great at attenuating some more of the acute pain effects, but preventing them from happening at all. Perhaps they could help if, if they're constantly keeping this prostaglandin E2 level down, then maybe there's less prostaglandin F2, so maybe that could work. I'll, I'll have to do a little bit more research into that. But it's definitely an interesting target to look into and preventing this prostaglandin F2 from being there in the first place. So now that we've arrived at this point where we've discussed the menstrual cycle, hormonal changes throughout the cycle, and ways to address the mood effects and some of the physical effects of the menstrual cycle with supplementation, where to next? in this question that we're asking, should men and women treat supplements differently? So I think we've answered perhaps for the most part in younger individuals that there's certainly a difference between men and women, but that it's maybe not as significant as a lot of people think. So when it comes to pharmacokinetics, if you are a smaller overall woman, then same with smaller overall men, by the way, consider a slightly lower dose, but specifically in smaller women, this seems to be a good consideration because you are more efficient at absorbing these things and reaching peak concentrations, which means you're in luck. It means you can use lower doses and have the same effects as a man who's maybe using twice the dose. On the flip side, maybe it's a little bit easier for men to dose because we have a little bit more uh, leniency or th there's not as many issues that could pop up potentially with higher doses, especially if we're looking at higher doses of water-soluble things because we can dilute them a little bit better or even looking at, unless you, you're a male with a lot of body fat, if you don't have a lot of body fat, then fat-soluble compounds probably won't stick around that long either. You might have shorter effect times, which can be beneficial. So consider that and, and those differences. For men, it's a little bit easier, it seems like. For women, there's a little bit more attention that needs to be paid to the menstrual cycle overall and some pharmacokinetic considerations. But... Then also consider that women are in a unique situation where they can exploit their menstrual cycle to enhance benefits. That being said, things really start to change as we age. So now we're going to get into a discussion about the way that hormones are decreasing as we age, specifically related to perimenopause and menopause, and ways that we can address these changes to benefit our health overall. And let's bring younger women into the equation just real quick and then look at testosterone enhancing supplements because I think this will be a good intro into menopause. So for young women who have their ovaries working at full potential, it means that the granulosa cells contain a lot of 
aromatase, which can take testosterone and turn it into estrogen. This likely also means that something like Tonga Dali is going to be a better strategy for younger women to increase testosterone because Tonga Dali has a very mild aromatase inhibiting effect. So this means that when taking Tonga Dali, younger women are like more likely to produce a little bit more testosterone because they have such high aromatase activity in their ovaries, which is where testosterone is also being produced. Now for older women who are in menopause or post-menopausal, their, their granulosa cells are very diminished, which means there is less aromatization happening, which means there's just less estrogen overall. This also means that a postmenopausal woman taking something like Tonga Dali is probably not the best idea because it's also inhibiting aromatase. And I think postmenopausal women need all the aromatase they can get. So for postmenopausal women, maybe stay away from Tonga Dali and look at something like Sistanche because, like we talked about earlier, Sistanche seems to enhance estradiol E2 levels while also increasing testosterone levels, which would be ideal for a postmenopausal woman. I like that we can make the distinction between the testosterone benefits from Tonga Dali for younger women and the testosterone benefits from Sistanche for older women. Because I think at a surface level, it's easy to look at Tonga Dali and the testosterone benefits and go, great, that should work for everybody. But you bring up a very important point about the aromatase aspect of menopause, postmenopause, and the fact that we need to address testosterone and estrogen levels differently as we age because of the other factors that are contributing to these hormonal changes. And honestly, women are a little bit in luck here because they have, in general, higher adipose tissue and fat stores. And aromatase also seems to exist at higher levels in adipose tissue. So having a little bit of extra um, body fat could actually be a good way to produce estrogen outside of the ovaries. Because after menopause, it becomes very hard to produce estrogen in the ovaries. And a lot of the issues we see in postmenopausal women is usually due to a deficiency in uh, estradiol E2 and some of the other estrogens. And because women need testosterone to produce estrogen, increasing testosterone levels is a great way actually to increase estrogen levels in a very natural and sustainable way. And because we want to avoid the aromatization, cystanch tubulosa would likely be a very good way for postmenopausal women to regain some extra estrogenic activity, which, as we talked about earlier, could then enhance focus, it could enhance mood. But more importantly, too, and something we haven't touched on, is estrogen actually plays a really important role in bone health, too. So estrogen causes bone remineralization, it makes our bones stronger, and it means that when we lose estrogen, our bones become a little bit more brittle, and you see in older women, especially postmenopausal women, that their bones become a little bit more brittle, and this is a, an issue that's more common in women than it is in men. So upping your estrogen levels could actually help keep your bones strong. Instead of taking calcium or something like that, Instead, we actually want to increase estrogen a little bit, but we want to be careful about increasing estrogen. So Sistanche is a fantastic option because it enhances estrogen through a somewhat natural pathway, just by providing a little bit more of the precursor for estrogen, which is testosterone, and then not inhibiting aromatase. So Sistanche is a fantastic supplement for that, and there's actually some research on it too which is really fascinating. So I think this is a, a Sistan should be a great postmenopausal supplement. With that in mind, just because it's so much harder to produce estrogen postmenopausally, we can come back to Panax ginseng too. 
And while panic ginseng can perfectly substitute for estrogen, it can enhance or it can produce some of the cognitive benefits of estrogen that are lost during uh, during menopause and in postmenopausal life. There's less estrogen, so there is less cognitive function. Mood can be lower, and this can be corrected somewhat by substituting some of this estrogen. But again, increasing estrogen can be a little bit tricky, so doing it in the most natural way possible is quite interesting, or by just mimicking some of this estrogenic activity in the brain by using something like Panax ginseng. So Panax ginseng and cystange could be a great postmenopausal stack for getting back some of that estrogen. And this is something that we see with a lot of people who are using Panamax, it seems like women generally respond really well to Panamax, and perhaps that's because of this estrogenic-like effect. Yes, absolutely. And honestly, I really like Panamax too, and this is something for men. Estrogen is important for men too, and this is maybe one of the reasons why I like cystanche a lot. Uh, and I think I like Sistange more long-term than Tonga Deli, and it might be because I'm upping my estrogen levels. And estrogen is just as important for men and has a lot of the same effects. So enhancing both my testosterone and estrogen at the same time is, is a great option, and Sistange does this for me. Um, what about enhancing estrogen levels for men as they age, will this also have benefits for testosterone production, or do these things change a little bit as men age? Well, it won't necessarily have benefits for testosterone production, but because men have lower testosterone levels as they age, it also means they have less of the precursor for estrogen, because in men, estrogen is also made from testosterone through aromatization. So the older we get, In men, it's a little bit opposite. We lose testosterone levels, which then has the the added effect that less estrogen can be synthesized, which is also not good. So for aging men, taking something like cystanche or taking cystanche and tonga dali together for a a more uh, robust increase in testosterone levels would be a really interesting thing to look at too. Because it would also increase estrogen levels as well. Yes. And here is actually where men and women start to converge a little bit more. Later in life, both men and women have issues with maintaining hormone levels. And this is important. For men, lower testosterone levels as we age can have libido issues. And for women, actually, as they age, lower testosterone levels can cause libido issues too. So they've looked at replacing some of this testosterone in uh, postmenopausal women, and it seems to have a somewhat positive effect on libido. So for both men and women after this, mm, so women go into menopause around the age of 49 to 51, and then menopause can last for about five years or or a lot longer. Um, But it means that likely right at around the age of 55, men and women start to converge a lot more and they start running into a lot of the the same age-related problems. It's less commonly talked about, but men also experience decreases in testosterone in the midlife uh, sort of era, and this can be referred to as andropause. Yes, absolutely. So very similar thing happens and that needs to be corrected for as well. For women, we want to increase estrogen more than we want to increase testosterone postmenopausally and postandropausally. For men, we want to increase testosterone a little bit more, but we also don't want to forget about estrogen because that's an important one too. Because for men as well, estrogen controls bone health. So if we have very low levels of estrogen, this is not good. And actually, testosterone also uh, controls bone health. So both play into each other. And enhancing those hormone levels a little bit as we age is really beneficial. And I'm excited because we've now kind of come full circle, starting with the conversation very, very, very in depth about the menstrual cycle and what hormones are actually 
a part of the changes throughout the menstrual cycle and how we might ride the wave and use supplements to maximize the benefits that we experience from the menstrual cycle, but then also moving into how our hormones change as we age and ways to address the decreases in estrogen and in testosterone in both men and women during that andropause and menopause phases. So now that we're talking about hormonal changes as we age, is there a way to slow this down? Because anti-aging is a really important aspect of health and of nootropic supplements in general. And I'm curious if there are specific supplements that are more applicable to men or women when it comes to this anti-aging quest. I think, interestingly enough, the anti-aging quest, it's going to work for both men and women. So the supplement recommendations are going to be pretty dividable between men and women or pretty applicable to both. The When we age, we see NAD plus levels go down. NAD plus is a compound that is generated from NMN or nicotinamide riboside. It controls a lot of oxidation throughout the body, inflammation throughout the body. And just quick question, is nicotinamide riboside and NMN endogenous compounds in the body? Yeah, they're both endogenous compounds. Uh, they both are a part of a cycle that generates NAD+. And both of them are precursors to NAD+, just at different parts in the cycle. NAD+, is really important for overall cellular health, though. And that's really where NAD plus shines. And I had a hunch that potentially if we increase NAD plus levels, we can actually benefit ovary aging. And that definitely seems to be the case. And it actually seems that enhancing NAD plus levels in your ovaries can uh, preserve fertility at later ages too. And it can enhance fertility. So this is a really interesting option for women who are listening to this who are looking at optimizing their fertility or women who have decided that they want to have children but they want to have children at a later age maybe uh, at, at 35 or something like that and when you are planning for having children later in life it could be a good strategy to take NAD plus enhancing compounds to help keep some of those granulosa cells in your ovaries a little bit um, more protected, which can help enhance fertility. But then on top of that, preventing some of this degeneration of granulosa cells also means we're keeping this nice aromatization center around, which means that maybe if we can enhance the health of these granulosa cells with something like NAD+, then you can prevent some of these issues that we see postmenopausally where you can't make as much estrogen. So that's a really interesting thing to look at, especially considering that NAD plus levels drop significantly as we age. So my question now is, why would supplementing or increasing NAD plus levels have benefits for men if men aren't experiencing the same kinds of ovarian aging as women? Yeah, it's because we experience testicular aging and because our testicles are the main uh, place where testosterone is being produced, the happier our testicles are, the more testosterone there is going to be. And testicles also need NAD plus level. So enhancing it there is going to help both men and women. So it definitely seems like the older we get, the more we converge there. And Part of the reason maybe why we converge more is because our hormones start looking more similar and women start fluctuating as much. So older men and women are probably easier to compare than um, younger men and women. men and women. But the interesting thing is men don't lose their ability to generate estrogen as significantly as women. And men don't rely on estrogen as much as women. So you see a much more severe impact in postmenopausal women when you look at cognitive effects and things like that compared to what happens in men as they age. But both are not great. So NAD plus levels go down both men and women. We can up them by taking NMN or nicotinamide riboside or actually I'm currently taking both. Um... 
because they are a little bit complementary here and there. Nicotinamide riboside is a little bit more neuroprotective, for example. But another thing that goes down is melatonin. So as we age, melatonin goes down, sleep gets worse because of that too. But melatonin is a very interesting oxidation regulating compound that works throughout the body and it has been shown that there's fairly high levels of melatonin in the ovaries and surrounding granulosa cells. So maintaining adequate levels of melatonin could also help protect these granulosa cells and help slow down ovarian aging a little bit. This is fascinating and I'm going to go on just a brief tangent here because earlier in the podcast, or maybe not in this podcast, but we were having a discussion about the effects of ovarian aging in general when it comes to vascular health and how decreasing estrogen can actually have detrimental effects on your eyes. And I'm remembering conversations we've had in previous podcasts talking about the presence of melatonin in the eyes as a part of eye health. So is there a connection here between ovarian aging, decreases in estrogen, and the need or the idea of supplementing melatonin as we age because these systems are all connected to each other, specifically melatonin and estrogen. Yeah, absolutely. There, There's definitely like a, a two-pronged effect here because melatonin can protect granulosa cells and granulosa cells are the main place where estradiol is being created and estradiol has an effect on blood flow and on eye health. So that part of melatonin could have a positive effect even on eye health. But then also because melatonin levels drop as we age, upping them and especially making sure we have higher levels of melatonin in our eyes, for example, because they're dropping and then taking some extra melatonin could have a two-pronged vision eye health effect. This is really interesting, and and I'm glad that we got to discuss that just briefly, because I think the more that I learn about hormones and the way that hormones change as we age, the more I'm aware of the benefits of supplementing these endogenous compounds like melatonin, like NMN, like nicotinamide riboside, because truly, as we age, these endogenous compounds are the things that are perhaps fluctuating the most rather than our sex hormones. And by staying closer to our baseline, we may be able to have the same or or a more optimal daily health and just general quality of life rather than earlier in life where these hormonal changes are much more dramatic and we're trying to, you know, kind of smooth out the effects of perhaps the menstrual cycle or different phases that we experience early on. Absolutely. So the the picture completely changes as we age and it's just as important and we need different strategies. So when, when we're talking about differences in supplementing between men and women to a certain degree maybe they're actually not that different except for when you control for the menstrual cycle and you can exploit certain parts of it but maybe the the real question we we should be asking too here or one of the the questions we should be asking here too is what are the differences between young men and women and older men and women and there seem to be some pretty significant changes there for a supplement recommendation. So for older individuals, I would definitely consider upping your glutathione levels. Your glutathione levels go down. Glutathione is a very important oxidation regulating compound too. Your carnosine levels go down. So supplement with a little bit of carnosine. Um, your melatonin levels go down. So you can supplement with a bit of melatonin. Your testosterone levels go down and your estrogen levels go down and you can supplement those with Tonga Dali and Sistange. So more so enhancing those endogenous compounds that we're losing as we age, enhancing those with supplementation is a really good strategy as we age. And that seems to be a really good strategy for both men and women, somewhat equally, actually. I feel like this is a great point to kind of wrap up everything that we've discussed so far in the podcast because we've gone 
very, very in-depth into a number of topics and overall gotten back to this point where we can identify their specific times in men and women's lives where we might want to consider treating our supplements differently. And actually, one thing that we missed is libido, and I think we should quickly touch on this. So as we talked about with uh, postmenopausal women, a lot of the effects that they experience is through blood flow. Um, Estrogen controls a lot of blood flow. And blood flow is a very important part of libido and sexual activity. And it's usually only seen that this is an issue for men. So as men age, erectile dysfunction becomes more prevalent and that can definitely make sex very hard and it could definitely impact your libido. The same is often not discussed for women, but women have uh, erectile mechanisms in their vaginas too. So enhancing some of this blood flow there, especially considering that estrogen normally controls a lot of blood flow, then if we're losing this, it also seems realistic that postmenopausal women are potentially losing some of their libido due to alterations in blood flow. And a really interesting thing to look at here then is the horny goat weed, which we'll discuss a little bit more in depth in a second here. But horny goat weed contains icarin, which inhibits an enzyme called PDE5. This enzyme is very highly expressed in penile tissue, which is why PDE5 inhibitors are very popular for enhancing erectile function in men. But in women, in their vaginas and surrounding their clitoris, there is also a lot of tissue that contains a lot of PDE5. So inhibiting PDE5 seems to drastically enhance blood flow there. And this can help enhance libido and it can enhance sexual pleasure for women who have lost some of this due to menopause. And There's some recent research on this, and it's still really unknown because it seems strange that women would be taking a PDE5 inhibitor because people, most people don't think about arousal in women surrounding around blood flow and engorgement of certain parts of their vagina, but that's definitely important. And actually, there's an interesting name for it called the orgasmic platform that's gets generated due to this enhanced blood flow and so that could be a really good strategy for both aging men and women to both be taking PDE5 which or or both be taking PDE5 inhibitors which then further illustrates that as men and women age they converge more and their issues are more related. So speaking of this relationship between the changes that men and women experience especially with libido as they age. I think it's time for us to move into the next segment of our podcast, which is new product releases. So every month we discuss the new products that have been released since the last podcast episode. And this month we have a really exciting array of releases to discuss with you. The first of which is going to link directly into this conversation we were just having, which is about libido. And so we are going to start by discussing this very exciting product that we have recently come out with, which is Horny Goatweed 10% Icarin Capsules and Powder, as well as Horny Goatweed 50% Icarin Capsules. Emil, tell us about this particular product, why it's special, and who should consider taking it. Yeah, so Horny Goatweed is a herb that a lot of people I've heard about because of its funny name. It's been around for a really long time, but it has some really fascinating effects, and this is coming through mainly through Icarin. So let's talk about the 50% extract first. The 50% extract is very selective, so it's pretty much just Icarin with not a whole lot else going on. So if we're just looking at what Icarin is doing, Icarin is acting as a PDE5 inhibitor, which can increase penile and vaginal blood flow, which can have major libido enhancing effects. And let's not leave out clitoral blood flow as well. Yes, I'm including that in vaginal uh, blood flow, but that's probably not entirely correct. 
So just together, there's a lot more blood flow happening there, which can enhance sexual pleasure for both men and women. Um, this is a, always a great thing. And if we're then looking at the actual libido enhancing effects, Icarin seems to mimic testosterone. And the testosterone has a libido enhancing effect, both in men and women. And due to the fact that it's not actually producing more testosterone and it's mimicking testosterone, it's a very interesting effect. And especially an interesting effect in postmenopausal women who might need all the testosterone conversion to estradiol that they can get going past this mechanism and just using something that acts directly on androgen receptors and mimics testosterone could be a really good way for postmenopausal women to enhance their libido but also for younger women to enhance their overall libido and even for younger men to enhance their libido more blood flow there is is always a good thing even if there's there's no real issues with blood flow either so then when we're talking about the differences between the the two horny goat weed extracts when we make extracts we delete a lot of stuff if we're uh, getting a higher standardization so let's as an example use coffee when we make coffee we start with coffee grounds uh, my recipe starts with 20 grams of coffee then I make espresso with it. So let's say this is the extraction method that I'm using, using water, high pressure water to make a concentrated extract. So I take my 20 grams of espresso and then I extract 40, or I take 20 grams of my coffee bean and then I extract 40 grams of espresso. This espresso contains a lot of water, but it also contains quite a lot of dissolved solids that I've taken out of the coffee. What I do now though is I throw the coffee puck away. So I'm basically throwing away a bunch of different compounds, but I also concentrated a bunch of different ones. I concentrated caffeine, I concentrated some of the sugars, um, I, I probably concentrated some trigonelline and some other beta carbolines, some interesting compounds. But I've made a very crude full spectrum extract here, but I've also thrown away quite a bit. Now if I take this espresso and I further refine it and I take all of the caffeine out and then purify the caffeine and have 98% caffeine, then it's going to have very different effects versus drinking a cup of espresso versus just taking caffeine. And to get just caffeine, I again have to throw away quite a bit of the espresso to get to just caffeine. The same thing happens with supplements. and. For horny goatweed, something really interesting happened. The whole herb contains quite a few flavones, and when we concentrate icarin, we have to get rid of a lot of these flavones, and then we end up with very high icarin levels, which is very beneficial, but we're losing a lot of these other compounds that are naturally present in horny goatweed. And we've come to find through beta testing that these other compounds are actually really pleasant, and the 10% horny goat weed still contains a lot of these other compounds. We haven't necessarily uh, quantified what they are or identified what they are and quantified how much of it is in there. But if we look at the chromatograms coming out of our um, HPLC and UPLC, we see that there's a lot more going on than just Icarin. And in beta testing, we noticed a really remarkable mood-enhancing effect that was not present in the 50% Icarin. So if you are looking for a very true representation of what whole horny goat weed might feel like, then the 10% is a really good option. And it's my personal favorite. It's one I've been taking daily now, and I really like the mood-boosting effects of it. I also really love the mood boosting effects of the 10% Icarin horny goat weed. And one thing I also noticed was though these blood flow benefits are being talked about in reference to libido enhancement and just overall sexual pleasure, I also found that when taking this supplement, I felt some pretty noticeable muscle relaxing effects as well as just a general 
feeling of better circulation and I felt that I could breathe deeper and I felt that I could sense tension in my muscles a little bit more than I would if I had not taken the supplement, which in general, I think is a really fascinating effect of this supplement and something I don't experience with a whole lot of other products. Interesting. Yeah, that could definitely be the the unique blood flow enhancing effects. And PDE5 inhibition is not just good for enhancing blood flow to sexual or erogenous areas. It actually also enhances cardiovascular function and just general overall blood flow. So taking a PDE5 inhibitor, especially something that's not a crazy strong PDE5 inhibitor like Icarin, is a really good strategy for just maintaining overall vitality, cardiovascular health, libido, sexual health, all of those things. It's a fantastic supplement. So let's now get into another supplement that we discussed a little bit earlier in the podcast, which is nicotinamide riboside. We've released it in capsules and in powder. Yeah, this is a very nice complement to our NMN that we also have. So both NMN and nicotinamide riboside enhance NAD plus levels. NMN seems to do it a little bit more efficiently than nicotinamide riboside, but on the flip side, nicotinamide riboside comes with an additional benefit. So nicotinamide riboside seems to be a little bit more neuroprotective, and both nicotinamide mononucleotide and nicotinamide uh, riboside are neuroprotective, but within axons uh, of, of neurons, you can have high levels of nicotinamide riboside. And nicotinamide riboside itself in these axons can enhance um, protective effects. So nicotinamide riboside of the two NAD plus precursors seems to be the most neuroprotective. For, so for those looking for more nootropic type effects, nicotinamide riboside is a good option. For those who are freaks like me, and who want the best of both worlds, just stack them together. That's what I've been doing. And in fact, I've also been stacking it with apigenin, which is a CD38 inhibitor. CD38 breaks down NMN, so inhibiting it means NMN can stay, or or, sorry, CD38 um, degrades NAD+. So taking a CD38 inhibitor means that NAD+, that's generated, from taking NMN or NNR or both can then ensure that NAD plus levels stick around a little bit longer. So that's been my NAD plus optimized stack that I just started a few days ago. So NMN, nicotinamide riboside, and apigenin. I would definitely recommend that if you're looking to maximize the most amount of NAD plus and also get some of those unique nicotinamide riboside neuroprotective effects. Very cool. Another exciting supplement that we've released since the last podcast is saffron capsules. And there's been a lot of questions on Reddit about this, about the actual mechanism for how this product works and what it's benefiting. But Emil, set the record straight for us. What is saffron up to? Yeah, so besides providing lots of uh, happiness and joy in dishes like paella, and uh, I I actually really like Middle Eastern desserts that have a lot of saffron in it. Uh, They're super interesting to me, and recently, actually, I've been seeing it more and more at at fancy coffee places. They're they're putting saffron in their coffee, which is also kind of crazy because it's a really expensive spice, but not to to go on too much of a tangent saffron is a great mood booster and it's a great mood booster because it seems to inhibit the reuptake of serotonin and specifically it seems to enhance serotonin levels in the uh, hippocampus or it seems to enhance the reuptake process of serotonin within the hippocampus and that seems to be how it's promoting mood With that in mind, and with the topic of conversation of this podcast in mind, taking saffron at certain points of the menstrual cycle, like when estrogen is at its lowest, would be actually a good way of enhancing overall serotonin levels, which could help keep your mood a little bit more stable. So the next new product release that we're going to discuss is Shizandra Chinensis. And Emil, tell us about Shizandra and what benefits it has. So Sishandra is a very interesting plant. You see it a lot in traditional Chinese practices, 
and it's being used as an absorption enhancer often. So uh, an absorption enhancer we're all probably quite familiar with is piperine, uh, a compound in black pepper, and this enhances bioavailability by inhibiting some of the cytochrome P450 enzymes. And schizandra, on the other hand, is a pretty good P-glycoprotein inhibitor. P-glycoprotein is a pump, basically, that effluxes compounds that have been absorbed. So let's say you are taking Panax ginseng. Panax ginseng is a substrate for the P-glycoprotein pump, which means that it gets taken up by it, but then it can also get pumped out by it, which means that maybe the ginsenicides will absorb in your intestines and then before they can actually reach your brain or other parts of your body where they need to exert their effects they get pumped out again you basically poop them out which is not good so using something like schizandra you can uh, inhibit some of this peak lycoprotein activity and if you take schizandra alongside panax ginseng for example then you can enhance ginsenicide absorption level and overall ginsenicide levels, and you can increase the effects of Panax ginseng. This is actually something we utilized in the Panamax stack, which contains schizandra. Schizandra will also enhance the bioavailability of other compounds that are efflux by peak lycoprotein. Uh, one that immediately comes to mind is actually berberine. Berberine is efflux by... Um, peak lycoprotein, so taking schizandra and berberine together would be a great stack. Uh, Another thing that gets hit by peak lycoprotein pretty hard is polygala, so a stack of schizandra and polygala would be really interesting, and actually I think a stack of schizandra and um, polygala and berberine and ginseng would be a really interesting stack there'd be a lot going on there a more simple stack mostly for mood would probably be panax ginseng polygala and schizander all acting or all being efflux by pgp so all benefiting from that schizander effect now schizander on itself also has some interesting effects so it has a very pleasant subtle calming but also mood boosting effect and this is definitely something that you notice in Panamax as well there's an an extra layer of relaxation an extra layer of mood enhancement and this is coming from the schizandra so schizandra just by itself is also a fantastic way to enhance mood awesome so now moving on to our next new release product we have an optimized vitamin e product in capsules and this is something that we're really excited about. So Emil, tell us a little bit about why it's important to take vitamin E. With any vitamin, you need a vitamin. It, it just means it's essential to daily overall life. So enhancing vitamin status is always a good idea, especially for ones that get used a lot in oxidative processes, especially because yeah, in this day and age, we are faced with a lot more oxidative stress. So having more of these endogenous antioxidants around like vitamin E is a great way of attenuating some of this. The form of vitamin E that we went with is D-alpha-tocopherol succinate, which is one of the best uh, vitamin E supplements for a multitude of reasons. One of them is that alpha-tocopherol is one of the most recognized forms of vitamin E and actually It's the only real vitamin E supplement. Other vitamin E supplements or other uh, supplements related to vitamin E, so the tocotrienols and some of the other tocopherols, are not necessarily considered vitamin E. So you have to call them tocotrienols or tocopherols. With alpha uh, or with alpha tocopherol, you can actually call it vitamin E because this is what, what we look at with vitamin E status. And alpha tocopherol has its own transporter so it can get shuttled around a lot more easily. Another benefit, especially with the alpha tocopherol succinate, is that it's a powder, and most other tocotrienols and tocopherols exist as liquids, so formulation can be really tricky, because making soft gels for a company like us, if if you don't have your own soft gel equipment, which is extremely expensive, 
then it's pretty much impossible to make custom soft gel formulations. So this is something we try and stray away from and we try and found powders that we can put in capsules. With this vitamin E, that's exactly what we get. And we have a very optimized version of alpha tocopherol. So we're using the dextrorotatory isomer. This is what the D stands for. And then the succinate salt, one, it makes it a powder, and two, su succinic acid actually has some nice cellular energy benefits and seems to enhance absorption. So this is a really interesting overall vitamin E supplement. And it actually also, relating back to some of our earlier conversations, has an effect on prostaglandin levels as well and seems to inhibit some of the prostaglandin levels. And this is something that only d alpha tocopherol succinate seems to do. Wow. Very, very comprehensive understanding of why we should be considering taking this vitamin E supplement. Oh, and actually one thing that I missed is that vitamin E has very interesting cognitive enhancing abilities, which is why it's in a mega tab as well. So it's a good one to take just for overall cognitive health, overall cardiovascular health, and, and just increasing your antioxidant status. Good to know. So now moving on to another new release, Celastris Paniculatus Capsules and Powder. Yeah, this is a fascinating one and, and one we've looked at for a really long time. And we were trying to really figure out what is in Celastris Paniculatus and trying to find a lot of research about it, but it's, it's very under-researched even though it has a long history of human use and it seems to be a highly revered nootropic in Ayurveda. So we always wanted to come out with something and we were never sure how to extract it or what compounds to look for. So we started by a bit of trial and error over the years and we found a pure water extract actually that we really like the effects of. And for me it really dials in mental clarity and over time it enhances uh, memory but it's a really clean effect and I find that it mixes in well with different stacks but the mental clarity effect is top notch awesome and last but very not least caffeine and melt capsules yeah so if you have ever tried caffeine L-theanine and you think it's a little bit too light and too calming, then caffeine nalt is the, the better option for you. So caffeine nalt definitely, or nalt, which is combined with caffeine in this scenario, nalt is N-acetyl-L-tyrosine. So it's an acetylated version of the amino acid tyrosine. And tyrosine is one of the precursors for dopamine. And caffeine, one of the ways by which it works is it antagonizes adenosine receptors. And the effect that this has, it has a very large effects profile, but one of the effects it has is that it enhances dopamine levels. So then enhancing dopamine synthesis alongside it can be a syn synergistic effect. And NALT also appears to have some interesting calming and mood boosting effects that we don't see in regular L-tyrosine. We're not exactly sure why the research isn't necessarily there to explain it yet. But subjectively, we've noticed this, and we noticed that NALT and caffeine together make a really good combination for smoothing out the stimulation and making it more of like a cozy, warm stimulation, mood boosting and stimulation, but then also enhancing the stimulant activity of caffeine. So it's like the polar opposite, I guess, of caffeine L-theanine, where caffeine L-theanine is designed to smooth and dampen the effects of caffeine, where this is um, intended to smooth, but also enhance the effects of caffeine. Awesome. So that concludes our new product release segment of the podcast. And we are now going to move into the most anticipated and my personal favorite segment of the podcast, which is asking your questions from Reddit and answering them with Emil. Now, before we jump into our Reddit Q&A segment, we have a special offer for all of you In Search of Insight podcast listeners. You can now use the coupon code HORMONES22 for 10% off your next order from Nootropics Depot. That's all caps H-O-R-M-O-N-E-S 22 for 10% off 
your next Nootropics Depot order. As a thank you to you podcast listeners for helping us guide and interacting with the In Search of Insight podcast. Now let's get into these questions and answer them with Emil. So our first question comes from Kodiak Dog, and the question is, it'd be interesting to talk about the inferred libido enhancing effects of certain products and how they affect women differently than men. I think the end conclusion we reached throughout the podcast is that when it comes to libido enhancing supplements, they're going to be pretty much the same for men and women because men and women have very similar uh, mechanisms mechanisms or neurological functioning when it comes to uh, libido and also in terms of in their sexual organs they have similar machinery like we talked about with pde5 inhibition it, it's a not necessarily a way to enhance libido but to enhance sexual function and even though we only associate this effect with men it definitely works in women as well because there's erectile um properties in vaginal and clitoral areas too which are important to overall sex so i think in general they're very comparable and if there is a libido enhancer that works for men it will very likely work for women too very cool all right moving on to our next question from hebron 045 the question is are there any supplements that have substantial benefits for men or women that may only be moderately beneficial in the other? Is there such a thing as gender hyper-responding? Really, really great question. And not really something that I've found, actually. So there definitely seem to be some minor differences here and there. Um, like we talked about with Tonga Deli and postmenopausal women, perhaps not the greatest idea because of the slight anti-aromatization effects. But other than that, men can benefit from estrogenic, extra estrogen, estrogenic activity. Uh, women can benefit from more testosterone activity. So I think it's kind of counterproductive to really hyper focus on these effects. And I know this gets done with a lot of different supplements. Um, a lot of skin health supplements get marketed primarily towards women. This does not mean that they work better in women than they work in men. It just means that women are maybe a little bit more concerned with physical appearance than men. But on the flip side, I really like the skin health supplements too, because when my skin looks better, I feel more confident. This might not be a thing for most men, but I think if men open their minds a little bit more, then we can benefit from female supplements too. Cool. I like that response. Another question from Wanto Conero, which is, what about older people older than 65? Would be interesting to hear as myself and many others develop stacks for our aging parents. And this is something we touched on quite a bit in the podcast, talking about the fact that as we age, uh, the health concerns for men and women actually start to converge a little bit more and become more similar. So how would this affect your stack development ideas for aging parents, for example? Yeah, so as we talked about, I would definitely uh, recommend upping those endogenous factors that might be dropping. So glutathione, L-carnosine, melatonin. Um, I'm sure some of the, the minerals are diminished a little bit at that point. Some some zinc and maybe some magnesium would help. Um, but definitely getting those endogenous compounds under control. And whenever I've recommended stacks to older family members, this is always the route I go and it always seems to work really well. So I would always go with the endogenous ones. And some more examples would be palmitoyl ethanolamide, so PEA, um, oleamide even for sleep, uh, choline, tyrosine, things like that would, would be great additions for older individuals. But then if we're talking about specific effects that are associated with aging, like we talked about throughout the podcast, women have issues with estrogen. So uh, getting estrogen levels up a little bit more, like with cystanch is a good idea. Uh, using Panax ginseng to kind of uh, have some estrogenic effects. 
than for men focusing a little bit more on testosterone, so taking something like Tonga Daily to help enhance overall testosterone levels, which are dropping. And then for both men and women, I would definitely recommend enhancing NAD plus levels. Awesome. So now moving on to our next question from Taiham. In addition to supplements that may be fertility enhancing, I'm also interested in which supplements should be avoided when trying to conceive. For example, birth control for women is similar to progesterone and or estrogen. Experimental but not too successful male birth control is similar to testosterone. Given that exogenous sex hormones could reduce fertility, are there any supplements that should be avoided when trying to conceive? Anything else to be avoided? Very interesting question. Absolutely. And I think in general, actually, exogenous uh, hormones, unless they're being administered at enormous doses, are actually going to have a pro-fertility effect, especially when it comes to testosterone, because enhanced testosterone synthesis will also uh, benefit spermatogenesis and benefit sperm health. In terms of things to avoid, hmm, that's a good question, but... When I was doing a lot of research, I, I didn't really come across things to avoid, rather things to to do to help enhance uh, fertility. So if I'm just racking my brain for something that, that might decrease fertility, if we're thinking about women, it would be things that are negatively impacting the ovaries and the, the quality of uh, the oocytes or the eggs. I can't really think of something that would negatively impact them because that would mean something is uh, increasing inflammation or oxidation. And as far as I know, most of the stuff we have has the opposite effect and should have a protective effect. So I can't really think of something to avoid. I could definitely recommend avoiding lots of environmental stressors, work stress, things like that, um, making sure oxidation is under control, making sure your your diet is correct and you're sleeping properly, just making sure that all of the basics are under control, you're at your baseline. I, I mean, maybe one thing to avoid would be stimulants because they can impact sleep and maybe impact your recovery and maybe could impact fertility so but more through lifestyle choices perhaps yeah so in terms of supplements i'd have to maybe do dig a little bit deeper because some of this information can be quite hard to find um, because people don't necessarily want to look at things that decrease fertility unless they are environmental pollutants or something like that instead Research is more focusing on positive effects, and positive effects usually get posted. This is actually a big problem within research, because we need to be posting more negative effects, but we like to post positive effects. So you'll see a lot of research on pro-fertility stuff. You won't see a whole lot of research on anti-fertility stuff. But I would say anything that has anti-androgenic effects is probably not the greatest thing for fertility. That being said, I can't really think of anything that's like severely... A no -go. anti androgenic yeah. Cool. Good to know. So, in general, then, we would say focus on the additives when it comes to fertility and lifestyle changes. And if you do find interesting research about what not to do, share it with us on Reddit, because I'm sure there's a lot of people who are curious to read about it. So, moving on to another question we had from Increasingly Trippy is, is there anything that should be con taken into consideration about the differences with non-hormonal supplements, dose, time of day, cycling, etc. And if so, which Nootropics Depot supplements might you want to note these aspects and nuances for, for men and women on product pages? This is a really interesting and somewhat complex question. So to distill it down a little bit, are there differences in dose, time of day, or cycling recommendations that you have, Emil, for men versus women. And we actually did cover this a little bit in the podcast earlier. Yeah, so I would, if you're a woman, I would definitely look at the menstrual cycle and supplement accordingly to it. If you're a man, you have it a little bit easier and you don't necessarily have to think about this and you can take it more 
long term without necessarily having to tweak it again like we talked about earlier women might have the distinct advantage that they can achieve more specific and higher level effects in terms of dosage it's another thing we talked about if you're a smaller woman just take into account your overall body composition and size and dose accordingly you might not need to dose as high Uh, most of the doses we design are based on a 75 kilogram human Um, and honestly when i think about it we we don't necessarily look at the different sexes but if i would have to just wager a guess what we're basing this on it's on a 75 kilogram male rather than a 75 kilogram woman so it's something we can maybe think about with our dosages too but as we talked about in the podcast i haven't seen very major um, dose responses between different sexes so i haven't necessarily seen women responding to a much higher degree to some of our beta testing rounds than men so in practice how significant is it really so to to simplify it yet again um the dosage question for men versus women is still somewhat up in the air but also more related to just overall body composition rather than sex differences um time of day i would say this isn't necessarily relevant whatsoever in men versus women well it it can be like for example if you look at Uh, cortisol that that's under uh, circadian control too so it's much higher in the mornings than it is in the afternoons but between men and women but between men and women there there really isn't much of a difference there sure so i would say that the only portion of this question that would be relevant in terms of uh, difference between men and women is this part about cycling and that refers to the conversation we had earlier in the podcast about cycling supplements during the menstrual cycle to basically optimize your health during that time yeah absolutely i think that should be the main consideration that if you're a woman pay attention to that that's very interesting and i would definitely try and exploit that awesome so now moving on to our next question from fam with no chill they ask can you go into how hormonal birth control can interact with nootropics So this is a bit of a a tricky question because it's getting into medical territory. So if you listen to the podcast, we touch on this here and there. I think I'll leave it at that. Great. So unfortunately, not able to answer your question in depth, but we do encourage you to check out the information that we've provided in the podcast and do some of your own research as well. And just take into account that the menstrual cycle fluctuations in hormones likely will not happen when you are taking exogenous hormones and it won't happen in the same way yeah yeah Yeah. all right so moving on our next question comes from some name not taken and this question is i've seen advice on male fertility supplementation so should women take the same supplement approach and if not what should women alternatives for fertility be There's a lot of overlap there again. Um, As we talked about, enhancing granulosa cell health is a really good way to enhance fertility in women. One of the ways this can be done is by supplementing with NMN, NR, or even apigenin to help enhance these NAD plus levels. And that will help protect the ovaries in general, and that can help enhance um, fertility. Something else would be melatonin or just other general uh, oxidation regulating compounds. And then uh, things like cystange may even help enhance fertility to a certain degree. But other than that, I think a lot of the the female and and male supplements for fertility likely share quite a bit of back and forth. And in fact, when you're thinking about fertility for getting pregnant, you need a male there too and a female so it sometimes maybe it's more of the male's job to do the hard work to enhance his sperm quality because it's really a a partnership of getting pregnant and and even if you're 
not with a male partner and you're going through a sperm bank or something like that. The, the quality of the sperm is important for fertilization. The higher the quality of the sperms, the, the healthier the sperms, the easier it will be for them to fertilize an egg. Of course, the egg needs to be of a high quality too. One of the ways we can ensure that is by making sure these granulosa cells are nice and happy by increasing their NAD plus levels, by enhancing melatonin levels, by enhancing just overall oxidative status. But getting pregnant is definitely a equal effort, it seems, between men and women. And sperm needs to be good and eggs needs to be good. But maybe there's a little bit more of an emphasis on the sperm being a little bit better. Good to know. So now moving on to our very last question for this podcast. This one comes from 3451355 And the question is, women on average weigh less than men, so should their dosage of particular supplements be adjusted to reflect this? Also, how does menstruation cycles affect supplementation, i.e., should certain supplements be avoided at certain times of the cycle? Now, we have actually discussed this second part of the question at length, and we've also discussed the first part of the question uh, just regarding body composition at length as well. So, Emil, is there anything else you'd like to add to answer this question specifically? I can just give a, a, a quick overview here. So, yes, women on average weigh a little bit less. Um, this is not always true, but in general, that seems to be the case. Based on that, women could consider a lower dose, but based on what I've seen in beta testing, I don't always see huge differences, but women might be a little bit more sensitive to certain compounds, especially during different times of their menstrual cycle. So like Erica was saying, if she takes subroxy right during that period where there's more estrogen and likely more dopaminergic activity, subroxy can push her over the edge. So limiting those kind of things intelligently during different parts of the menstrual cycle is definitely very beneficial and we go into this in length throughout the body of the podcast. Absolutely. So that concludes our Reddit question and answer segment and leads us into the end of the podcast where we say thank you so much for listening and for participating and for your support of the In Search of Insight podcast. Today we talked about some really fascinating aspects of the menstrual cycle of hormones as we age and we answered this question does it make sense for men and women to treat supplements differently and in certain times of our lives absolutely we can treat supplements differently and we can use supplements to help us optimize different phases that we're in whether it's throughout menstrual cycles for fertility purposes but especially as we age and the interesting thing is that as we age, our health concerns and health concerns related to hormones start to become more similar. So if anything, I think this podcast has revealed great details about women's experiences with their hormone cycles throughout their lifetimes, but also the fact that men and women may not be as different as we think we are, especially as we age, which I think is a valuable discovery and something to take away from this, especially as we think about supplementation for ourselves, for our parents, and optimizing our health as we move through life. Absolutely. And I think we should always stay away from um, sex-specific things, whether it is a sex-specific toothpaste or a sex-specific mirror or a sex specific car we love to market things to specific sexes because it helps sell more but that also means that both sexes are missing out on a lot if testosterone is only marketed testosterone enhancement is only marketed towards men then women are clearly losing out on these testosterone benefits because women can benefit from testosterone too on the flip side some of the estrogenic effects are majorly beneficial for men as they are for women. So there's definitely a lot of crossover there. And I think 
we shouldn't make that big of a separation, but we should be aware of some of the practical limitations and some of the interesting ways in which we can manipulate the menstrual cycle for benefits. I agree. And rather than seeing our differences as a reason to have completely different worldviews or completely different approaches to our supplements, the more we understand about ourselves and the more we understand about each other, the better equipped we are to use supplements to optimize our health, whatever our health status and whatever stage of life we may be in. So thank you again for listening to and supporting the In Search of Insight podcast. You can listen to this podcast on a variety of your favorite streaming platforms. And if you've enjoyed it, we ask you to give us a thumbs up and share this with your friends. If you'd like to chat with us and ask us questions about the podcast, send us a message and make a post on our subreddit. That's r slash Nootropics Depot. And we would love to chat with you about anything that we referred to in the podcast or other questions you may have about nootropics in general, the menstrual cycle, supplementation as we age, and anything related to optimizing our health. Absolutely. So at long last, thank you so much for listening and we'll see you next time. Bye. See ya.